Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am Ramit Mizrahi. I am a plaintiff side employment lawyer, and I'm going to do my best today to uh, step you through your rights, your legal rights as an employee uh, with autoimmune disease or with another disability. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, uh, again, uh, my name is Ramit Mizrahi. I have my own plaintiff side law firm in the Pasadena area, Mizrahi Law, and I represent employees exclusively in cases of discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and wrongful termination. Um, I had the, the privilege, the pleasure of speaking with all of you back in May 2020, um, and a lot has changed since then, right? The law has evolved, and we now have widespread availability of the vaccine. We have COVID treatments such as monoclonal antibodies, the Pfizer and the Merck pill, and we have more information about how COVID affects various vulnerable populations. Um, and we've also had some changes to California law. So I want to give you the caveat that I am a California lawyer who practices California law. Um, there are also federal protections. I'll touch upon them. But for those of you who are not in California, um, you know, some of the things that I say are not going to apply to you because I'm really focusing on California law today. So. Um, I really want to emphasize that when I'm speaking about workplace accommodations, every case is fact specific, and I'll explain that in a bit, right? The leave laws can have bright line rules, right? If you're entitled to 12 weeks, you're entitled to 12 weeks. But when you're talking about workplace accommodations, every, every case in every workplace um, is different. Um, there are also magic numbers. Some laws only apply to uh, employers of a certain size. Uh, 5, 15, 50 are all some magic numbers that you'll hear. Also, uh, unionized workers may have additional protections, uh, as may public employees. So to be clear, there are a lot of gray areas when we're talking about accommodations. Um, and for that reason, I give you the very lawyerly caveat uh, that this, this is not to be construed as legal advice every individual situation, please do um, seek out the advice of a lawyer if you're having issues getting the accommodation that you need in the workplace to figure out what your employer has to do uh, and what, um, you know, what they may not be required to do. Um, so where are we now, right? A lot has changed and the vaccine has been a real game changer, particularly before Omicron, but still now. Um, it's a, it's a game changer in that vaccinated individuals are less likely to get COVID and to transmit it, at least pre-Omicron, and are less likely to suffer death or severe effects. Um, that said, people with autoimmune conditions, um, including, including those who take uh, immunosuppressing uh, drugs, um, remain at risk, right, even when vaccinated. And, you know, folks may not develop the same antibody responses as others. And we've seen some evidence that COVID may trigger or exacerbate autoimmune responses, leading to more severe complications than the general public suffers. So, um, you know, Omicron can also change the calculation. When you have a surge, you've got a lot more risk of, of getting COVID than, you know, when we're, when we're out of these surges. So we've had a number of questions from you about remote work, right? What are my options if my employer has us returning to a physical job site and my doctor doesn't believe it's safe for me to return to the workplace, right? Can I ask to work remotely? What if my job can't be done remotely? What if my employer says I'm less productive when I'm working remotely? So first and foremost, uh, to answer these questions, I have to give you a big picture overview of what your disability accommodation protections are in the workplace. So. I assume that many of you have heard of the ADA, because it's kind of a household uh, word by now, the American with Disabilities Act, which is federal law, and it covers employers with 15 or more employees. Well, here in California, we have our Fair Employment and Housing Act, FEHA, which is our catch-all anti-discrimination in employment law, and it protects against discrimination, harassment, retaliation, of all of the protected categories uh, that, the, that, that are covered, right? Race, religion, national origin, sex, gender, age, disability, military status, it's actually quite a long list. Um, as relevant to today, it specifically identifies as protected physical and mental disabilities, medical conditions, genetic information. So the FIHA also contains affirmative accommodation obligations for workers with disabilities. 
and it applies to employers with five or more employees. So many of us, most of us are covered, uh, you know, are, are covered under the FIHA. Uh, for harassment protections, you only need one employee, but for, for uh, accommodations and what we're talking about today, five is our magic number. So the FIHA explicitly states that an employer must make a reasonable accommodation for the known physical or mental disability of an applicant or employee unless it creates an undue hardship for the employer. And, and those are a lot of words, a lot of legal mumbo jumbo, and so I'll define all of that for you. Um, I also want to tell you that the law prohibits retaliation or discrimination against a person for requesting an accommodation. So even if they tell you that they can't give you an accommodation, they can't retaliate against you for having asked, um, regardless of whether it was granted. So let's talk about what it means for an employer uh, to have reasonable accommodation obligations. So if you're an employee and you have a known physical or mental disability or a known medical condition, um, and you need a workplace accommodation, so long as you can perform what's called the essential functions of your job with or without that accommodation, the employer generally has to provide it to you. They either have to grant the request or they have to show special case specific circumstances that demonstrate that it would be an undue hardship for them. So there are all kinds of reasonable accommodations that an employee can get and that includes working remotely, working an alternate schedule, for example, not being around other people, asking for changes in workplace settings, right? Like being given a, a private office uh, versus being in a cubicle, getting plexi plexiglass shields, more, better PPE. Um, and when you ask for an accommodation, your employer is required to have something called an interactive process. So it's a timely good faith dialogue where they have a conversation with you and ask and try to figure out what is the effective reasonable accommodation that would let you do your job, right? And as I mentioned, they can only say no to providing you with an effective accommodation if it would create that undue hardship. So as we left off, I was explaining what is an undue hardship and the, um, the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, consideration is, you know, the impact on the employer, right? A significant difficulty or expense when considered in light of the following factors. So the, uh, the court or the, uh, you know, fact finder looks at the nature and the cost of the accommodation, uh, the overall financial resources of the facilities uh, involved in providing that accommodation, looking at things like the number of employees, the effects on expenses and resources, the overall financial resources of the entity, um, the types of operations, right, the composition, structure, functions of the workforce, um, and then, you know, like geographic considerations too. Um, this is all sort of vague sounding, but kind of the big picture is, um, you know, can the business continue to function, right? For some accommodations, it costs money, right? It costs money to build a ramp or to buy someone a particular device, things like that, and the finances of the entity kind of come into play there. For other accommodations, it's really a question of, you know, can the business function without this person? How much of a hardship is it to have um, a person in an important role, um, you know, not there or, um, you know, not doing certain things, what have you. So. Uh, for those of you who have been successfully working remotely for the past nearly two years, um, an accommodation of remote work sounds like a pretty reasonable accommodation, seems like a pretty reasonable option. I think most employers would be hard pressed to say uh, that you can't work remotely if you've done that successfully for this long. Um, and saying that someone is a little less productive or that it's like not great for morale, you know, it feels really good to have everyone back in the office, that's not enough to deny someone uh, their request, right? Saying, well, we like it better when you're here, that's not legitimate, right? If there are certain tasks that need to be done that can only be done on site, those sorts of things factor in, right? And as we've seen over the past two years, some jobs are a lot easier to do remotely. Right. Um, I think the, the statistic that I saw was that something like 40% of jobs translate to really easy remote work. 
Um, others can be harder. Um, and really the focus is on the essential functions of the job, right? If there's some tangential aspect of your job that's not essential to your job, um, and maybe that's a thing you can't do off-site, but someone else can do it, again, that seems to me like a reasonable accommodation. If it's a core part of your job uh, that you're not able to do, that makes it harder to say, right? So there's some jobs where everyone will agree it can't be done remotely. Bus driver, massage therapist, right? Server at a restaurant. Um, in those circumstances, other accommodations have to be considered, right? And those can be things like, uh, you know, again, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, shifting job hours, transferring to a vacant position, things like that. Um, now, some uh, doctors may determine that it's not safe for a person to return to the workplace, whether just overall or maybe when there's a surge or something particular in the, in the workplace or when someone's having a flare-up, something like that. Um, and at that point, leave as a reasonable accommodation becomes a consideration. Um, now, when the interactive process is happening, um, the employer is allowed to select between effective accommodation options. So if there are two different accommodations that you could get that would allow you to perform the essential functions of your job, both of them are effective, the employer can choose uh, you know, between them. Um, so an employee preference is favored, right, but is not required. Um, now, that said, leave uh, is, you know, job leave is considered an inferior option if there is an accommodation out there that would let you work uh, and to perform the essential functions of your job. So you shouldn't be forced out on a leave unless there's no better alternative. So let's talk about various leave laws, right? What if you genuinely cannot return to the workplace and your job can't reasonably be done uh, remotely without creating an undue hardship? So there are job protections through several laws. Um, there's paid sick leave, but that's really only for a short amount of time, right? Uh, minimum of three days a year throughout California, more in certain localities, places like LA, Santa Monica, San Francisco. There was supplemental paid sick leave in the earlier part of the pandemic, um, but that has since expired as of September of 2021. Um, I have the understanding that there's some potential legislation that would bring some of that back, but at this time, we don't have that. Um, now, there are also, uh, when we think about leave laws, at least for me, um, we think about, uh, you know, for, for lay people, they think about the FMLA, Family and Medical Leave Act, right? That's another household acronym. Here in California, we think about California law, which is the CIFRA, the California Family Rights Act, the CIFRA. So both of these laws provide for 12 weeks of job protected leave with the continuation of health care coverage. And that leave can be used for the serious health, care, health condition of an employee to care for certain covered family members with a serious health condition or for baby bonding within the first year of the baby's life or related to um, adoption and foster care. There's also certain military exigencies, but I'm not covering that here today. Now, CIFRA and FMLA leave are not paid for by the employer, but you may be able to get wage replacement through the EDD, the Employment Development Department, right? The, the Government Unemployment Agency and Disability Insurance Agency. Now, during the time that you're on a CIFRA uh, leave or FMLA leave, health insurance is maintained as if you were still working. So if the employer pays 100% of insurance, they still have to keep doing that. If you contributed 20% or 50% or whatever it is, you still have to keep doing that. Um, and your, they can invoice you or bill you for your portion because they don't have your salary or pay to deduct it from if you're not um, using up your you know, sick or vacation time. So a serious health condition that's covered by the CIFRA and FMLA is defined as an illness, injury, impairment, physical or mental condition that either you're receiving inpatient care or continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. And so generally speaking, someone with an autoimmune disease or uh, someone immunocompromised is going to have that sort of ongoing care that qualifies. Um, there are eligibility requirements. You have to have worked for the employer for at least 12 months and at least 1,250 hours in the last 12 months to be covered under the CIFRA. And the FMLA still does, and the CIFRA used to require for those who work for private companies, 
50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. Um, but a very exciting change since the last session, uh, effective January 1st, 2021, so this is now the law, the CIFRA now covers you so long as there are five or more employees at the company. Um, so long as you meet these other eligibility requirements, right? The 12 months, the 1,250 hours. Um, FMLA still does, and CIFRA used to cover only child, parent, spouse, domestic partner with a serious health condition, but now the law has been expanded to cover other types of household members, grandparents, grandchildren, siblings, domestic partners, parents-in-law, adult children, children of domestic partners. So it's important to note that that 12-week number is a, is a hard and fast rule. If you qualify, you get those 12 weeks, no matter the hardship or the impact on the employer. And so long as you continue to meet those eligibility requirements, right, you can, con you know, it, you're entitled to those 12 weeks every year. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, how, how, when I say every year, what does that mean? So there are four ways that employers can calculate uh, the the tw that 12 month period. They can say 12 months in a calendar year. They can say 12 months in a different but predetermined start and start time, like if they go by a fiscal year calendar. Um, they can do it uh, rolling forward, measuring forward. So if your day one starts on February 4th, 2022, then you're entitled to the 12 weeks between February 4th, 2022 and February 3rd, 2023. And more, most common is like a, a backwards looking thing where as you're taking leave, it's 12, it's up to 12 weeks within the preceding 12 month period and it kind of rolls and, and carries forward as you're making the calculation. So if within the past 12 months, for example, in that, uh, in that sort of way of calculating, you took six weeks, you'd still have six weeks left over. Um, now, the CIFRA allows for intermittent leave. And what that means is you don't have to take it all at once, right? If someone has flares of their condition, you know, they could have migraines, right? For any kind of conditions where you could have some really great days and then some rough days, you can have it taken on an as-needed basis. Your doctor will kind of make that clear that that's what you need, and then your employer has to oblige, right? So in theory, Someone with a condition could take a day off every uh, every week for a year, right? Because you still don't get up to the 12 weeks of days. Um, it's not that common. It's usually more, you know, it's usually not on a clock, but on an as-needed basis. Um, so, so back now I'm returning to the FIHA because the FIHA also has uh, leave as a potential disability accommodation, right? And unlike the CIFRA, the FMLA, there's no hard number, right? You can have leaves of as many months as you need as long as it doesn't create an undue hardship for the employer. So there's no fixed amount, there's no formula where the courts have said X is by definition an undue hardship. Um, the courts have said you can't have an indefinite leave if your doctor says, well, I don't know when the person can come back. That's bad, right? Because the employer is entitled to have at least a date certain to work with. Um, that date certain doesn't have to be 100% certain, right? It can be a doctor's uh, approximate estimate, you know, may return, you know, can return to work in two months to be reevaluated, something like that. It doesn't have to be kind of set, but just be very, you know, be sure that you don't just leave it open-ended because they can deny that. Um, revised return dates don't create an indefinite leave. Approximate dates don't make it indefinite, right? And in each of those cases, it's the same undue hardship analysis, right? So I give the example, let's say you have a, um, a telemarketing firm where there are, there's so much turnaround and you know people are just constantly getting hired and leaving and there's always job openings. Holding someone's job position when there's always job openings doesn't seem like a hard sell, doesn't seem like a hardship because there'll be a position to return to. But let's say you have someone who's in a really essential role, right? The CFO of a company or someone who is very hard to replace and they're gone for a very extended period of time beyond, for example, their, um, their CIFRA FMLA period, an employer may say, look, it's been really hard for us. Someone needs to do this job. We've been cobbling together you know, coverage for your job, but we really need you. In those circumstances, 
undue hardship is more likely to be established. And when a person gets leave as a reasonable accommodation or they take their uh, uh, CIFRA leave, um, they're entitled to be returned to the same or an equivalent position, right? So unless the employer shows that they would have eliminated that position anyway, like if there's a mass layoff, um, the person gets to get their job back. Um, I see a lot of the times where people take a leave, a job protected leave, whether it's a pregnancy leave or um, yeah, you know a, a CIFRA leave, and the employer realizes that they can do just fine without that person and has a layoff of one, and people, those people end up hiring me because that's generally problematic, right? The employer has to show that even if the person had never taken that leave, uh, they still would have been let go. Now, I've seen questions of, well, how do I ask, right? What documents do I need to give to my employer? So generally speaking, you don't have to use magic words. Um, you know, you don't have to, uh, there's no specific thing that you have to say to trigger an employer's notice, but the employer has to know, uh, you know, under the FIHA that you have a disability that needs an accommodation under the CIFRA, that you have a serious medical condition and that you need time off. Um, generally speaking, it's best to make your request in writing so that there could be no ambiguity about what you said and what you asked for. Uh, or if you ask orally, to just follow up in writing, you know, tell your manager orally, and then, hey, I just wanted to confirm that, you know, um, you know, for because of my disability, you know, I may need to work remotely, or I may need some time off, or something like that, right? Um, if you're asking for time off under the CIFRA or FMLA, but I'm going to keep saying CIFRA, um, the employer can ask for a medical certification form to be filled out by your doctor. Um, I really want to emphasize that in California, you do not need to disclose your diagnosis, right? Even under uh, the, the um, certification that the CIFRA requires, it doesn't make you provide that information. And in fact, it says do, to your doctor as they're filling out the form in caps, uh, don't reveal the underlying diagnosis without the consent of the patient. Instead, they look to your name or if you're caring for someone else, the patient's name and confirming that it's a protected relationship, the date the medical condition commenced, the probable duration of the medical condition, um, the form defines what a serious health condition is and asks the uh, doctor to confirm does the patient's condition qualify as a serious health condition, um, is the employee able to perform work of any kind, um, if they're unable to perform, uh, if the answer is no, then, you know, again, it's back to the amount of leave. Um, if they're able to perform uh, work, uh, then there's a question about, um, you know, are they unable to perform one or more of the essential functions of their job? Um, and when it's for a family member, there's some other questions. Uh, there's also questions about will the leave need to be intermittent and if so, the frequency and the anticipated duration, right? So there's a lot of information that your doctor can disclose about exactly what you need, um, but they do not disclose your diagnosis. When it is um, a FIHA request for an accommodation, um, it's the same thing. Your doctor does not need to give the diagnosis, but just something simple that lets the employer know so-and-so is under my care for a disability, they need a reasonable accommodation as follows. Insert what that is. Now, as I was saying, uh, that will then trigger a dialogue with the employer. Sometimes it's a very short dialogue because they go, okay, no problem, right? We've got, this is fine, you can work remotely. Sometimes they'll say, you know, this can be kind of challenging for us, let's talk, you know, what do you need to be away from? What do you need to work with, right? What are the, what are the limitations or, you know, what, either what you can't do or what you need um, and have that dialogue. Um, generally speaking, right, the, you, they, you don't need the doctor's note to put them on notice. Um, employers can't say, well, we didn't get a doctor's note, so we didn't know you needed this accommodation, but they're gonna want some medical documentation to back it up. And you have time to, to get that. Um, sooner is always better. In fact, it's better to even have the note in hand, you know, as you approach your employer and ask for the accommodation. But for the CIFRA certification, you're, you should have at least, uh, you should have 15 days to, to turn that around. Again, sooner is better. Um, I've, uh, I've heard questions about, well, so if I can't, uh, if I can't return to work, right, if I can't work remotely and I'm taking this job protected leave time, will it be paid? 
So uh, under the CIFRA and FMLA, it, the employer doesn't have to pay it, although you have certain options to use up sick and vacation time, all right, your PTO. Um, you, if it's to care for a family member, um, uh, a seriously ill family member, there's paid family leave through the EDD, which can be up to eight weeks. Um, there's disability insurance through the EDD, right, uh, SDI, state disability insurance. So there are some wage uh, replacement options that are out there. And some employees have uh, short-term disability or long-term disability insurance through their employers. So again, these protections apply uh, to you and the CIFRA further expands to cover you not being able to work if you're providing care for um, a family member with a serious uh, medical condition. Now, um, the California law is still a little bit fuzzy about this, but there's some case law that suggests that if you are associated with a person with a disability, let's say you have a family member who's immunocompromised, something like that, that the employer may have some accommodation obligations. Um, I'd say this again with sort of an asterisk, it's the, the law is, is still developing in this area, um, but if that is the case, again, um, you know, you, you should ask and see what can be done. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, with respect to health insurance, uh, it's the CIFRA FMLA leave that provides for that continuation. Uh, the FIHA doesn't necessarily provide for that. So again, you always have to look at your leave rights uh, and a lot of them overlap and they may give you different, better protections, right? But they, they all kind of are considered at the same time. Now, one of the questions that I saw asked was, um, you know, when you're interviewing for a new job, do you have to tell your employer, uh, do you have to disclose your diagnosis? So the short answer is no. Again, you don't ever have to give your diagnosis. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really a judgment call, right? My lawyer hat says you don't have to, uh, but it's really a judgment call because sometimes you share information and your employer, uh, you know, becomes more understanding and sometimes you share information and then they see you uh, in a discriminatory manner, right? So you, you kind of have to figure out if you go beyond what the law requires you to disclose, is your employer possibly going to be better at accommodating you or treating you better, right? I don't, have, I don't have an answer for that. I think it really is based on your kind of personal relationship um, with who you're working with. Um, now, I saw some questions about uh, the vaccines and the booster shots, right? Most people have been clamoring to get them, especially if they're in vulnerable groups, because uh, you know these antibodies can can make a real difference in terms of um, you know what happens when people get COVID. Um, but there are folks who have are having challenges, whether they have a severe allergy to one of the components in the vaccine, or um, you know in other rare circumstances where their doctors have made a determination that they're too vulnerable at this time to get the vaccine. Um, in my experience, from what I've seen as a practitioner, those are very, very rare, um, but they're out there. Um, and, and again, it's a conversation with the doctor. And at that point, the same undue hardship analysis applies, right? There's no bright line rule. Um, there are certain settings where there is no reasonable, you know, there's, there's not going to be a reasonable accommodation to allow an unvaccinated or unboosted person in the workplace. For example, certain hospital settings, preschools or settings where there are unvaccinated children, right, things like that. To me, it seems pretty clear cut that if a person um, is going to be unvaccinated, that there may be a lot of pushback. Um, these cases are now making their way through the courts. And so, um, I'm going to have a much more definitive answer for you in a year from now um, as as these things play out as a court, you know, a court may say, um, you know, uh, N95 masks and twice weekly testing may be sufficient. A court may say, no, too much risk. I just I don't have those answers right now. Um, but again, you look at the other things. Can remote work happen? Can there be can the person be isolated in a different work setting where they're not around other people who um, you know, may be exposed, um, and so on. Um, and then uh, finally, there were some questions about um, uh, you know, what happens if a person is 
uh, kind of sep you know, if, if a person ultimately can't return to work and is separated, um, and so again, under those circumstances, uh, there's there's looking into the options of um, you know, is this a situation where um, you know you've been let go and you can apply for unemployment, or is this a situation where you genuinely may not be able to find another job during this pandemic period? At which point, you know, there may be a disability option, and that's a conversation with your doctor. So I have been talking for a pretty long period of time. Um, I'm happy to see if there are any other uh, questions in, uh, in the chat. Um, but I have really, really enjoyed this opportunity uh, to speak to all of you about uh, your workplace rights. Yep, so I see uh, that right now there aren't any more questions. So again, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope that this has been a help for you.